Storytellers don't just talk about the world, they shape it. The stories we share are like soil. They're living, dynamic, and the kinds of stories we choose to tell determines the kind of world that grows around us. Hello, hello, welcome to Creative Changemaker. Today I want to talk about a tension that a lot of actors, artists, creatives, and advocates are feeling right now. So, anyone who's trying to attract an audience these days has to go up against the almighty algorithm in an effort to be noticed, to get the attention they need to build that audience. However, and here's the tension, it generally serves artists better to go for a more modest-sized audience that over time builds a deeper connection with your work than just trying to put out things to please the masses. The problem with that is if you don't please the masses well enough, your stuff won't get seen and probably won't be noticed by the people who could be in that inner circle. Okay, so at this moment, a lot of people have beef with Netflix. A lot of people have beef with beef on Netflix. That's a whole nother thing. This is gonna get confusing fast. And the beef I'm talking about actually goes back before everyone started going on strike against the studios. It's an older bit of beef than the current bit of beef. There's a lot of beef going around. It's like a well-stocked camiseria over at Netflix. Um, let me just explain what everyone's issue is. So Netflix, and they're certainly not the only ones who do this. I'm just kind of picking on them as a prime example. But they do this thing where they will release a new show. They will hype it up. They'll put it on their splash screen. It'll be the biggest deal, and it'll seem like you can't miss this show or you will be culturally obsolete and have no idea what anybody is talking about. And you'll see it everywhere. And you'll watch the show and you'll maybe get like a few episodes into it. And then you'll see the announcement. We are canceling the show. A thing that was getting all this hype, all this attention, doesn't even make it past the first season enthusiasm wave without getting canned. That's it. We're now moving on to Love is Blind in Space or something. Now, what's going on here? What's with the, the whiplash? A lot of the reason why these shows get canceled, of course, is because they're not doing numbers, right? Netflix is, has the top secret data as to how many people are watching, what, uh, what they're, you know, even if people are dropping out and uh, leaving the show to go watch something else midway through, they're paying attention to where exactly in the show this is happening. And as Netflix is monitoring these numbers, if they see that within the first week it doesn't look promising, it's probably not gonna be grooving right along like they had hoped, it's on to something else. Now, this is a big bummer because some of my favorite shows in recent years have fallen victim to this pattern. And, you know, sometimes the goal isn't to attract a massive audience. Not everything needs to be the next Breaking Bad or whatever. Uh, you know, there is room for these shows that people love more deeply, that attract like a smaller but very enthusiastic audience. There's room for that. Or is there? Yeah, every time Netflix does this, I really feel for the creative team behind these projects, right? It's like they poured a lot into it, and just as soon as momentum was starting to, to take off, boom, you're done. These days, the leash on shows is so short, it seems like a, a real unlikely scenario that we get something like The West Wing again, which ran for 10 seasons, and a show that goes for four is already, like, an old-timey show, like Barry. I think it's funny, as Barry had a plot line pretty much exactly about the scenario. Okay, so why am I talking about this? Well, it's because it's not just Netflix. It's basically the entire media landscape, including whichever one you play on. If a movie isn't performing well in its first week, a lot fewer theaters are gonna plan to bring it back for week two. On social media, if a TikTok or an Instagram post within its first hour doesn't get the, uh, the attention that the algorithm wants, then don't expect it to be shown to many more people after that. The algorithm felt it wasn't hitting the right taste clusters. If a news story isn't getting enough clicks, don't expect a media outlet to go ahead and run again with that same kind of story. On the other hand, if it does draw clicks, expect to see more of that. And this is why sensationalist headlines and clickbaity articles have become such a problem. But everything is geared 
to fuel that. Today's creative landscape really asks you to make a big splash. Do something that's gonna garner the most amount of attention in the smallest amount of time. And the problem with this is it's kind of antithetical to what generally makes for good creativity. Caveat, sometimes great things can be made in a pressure environment, but I think more often than not, creativity is a slow and steady process and there's gotta be room for observation and reflection. And even in times where it appears quick, it's because the artist has done a lot of that work behind the scenes to make it appear intuitive. All right, so what does this have to do with how creativity and activism go together? Well, if you've got a message to get out there, cause to promote or something like that, you're probably reliant on tools like social media, digital marketing, and this whole landscape of attention spans directly affects your ability to do that. All the tools you use are subject to the same media landscape. Big splash culture. Go ahead, make the biggest splash you can, otherwise we're just gonna bury this. And this is really unfriendly to the process that gets creativity and messages to the next level. Now, it's unlikely that this is going to change any time in the near future. It'll probably only go further in this direction. And in the meantime, we've got messages to get out there. We've got stories that need to be told. How is that supposed to happen? You know, you hear people with, like, legitimate levels of expertise, like PhDs in international economics being like, is nobody going to pay attention to my ideas unless I can sync them up to a dance? Eh, sometimes. It's fair to acknowledge the absurdity of this. At the same time, these are the cards we've dealt. And so, here are two things I've learned to make the most of this reality. First, even though it's like this, you still gotta find a way to honor the slow, steady rhythm of a creative practice. Look, the streaming services, the algorithms, the news channels, they don't honor this. But this doesn't mean you can't find your way to practice that slow process on your own terms outside of those spaces. Just a few ideas. First of all, it's really helpful and beneficial to have a place where you're releasing some work on a regular and a consistent basis and where you plan to keep showing up even if it's not doing numbers. Maybe this is like some sort of daily or weekly or monthly project where you plan on just showing up, rain or shine, doing the work and putting it out there. A lot of my creative work, the storytelling work I do every day, evolved from a decision I made 13 years ago to take a photo every single day. This went so well, I pretty much still do this because it's brought that much value to my life. I don't release the photos, well I do, but you know, it's not my main thing anymore, but it still is a creative discipline that makes me pay attention to the world. Because this project was taking off at the same time social media was really becoming more widespread, uh, it allowed me to also focus on caption writing, and that evolved into my whole practice of storytelling. So much of what I do can be traced to that project, a photo a day. And it never got a whole lot of attention, but it helped me move forward as a creative, a big deal. There's a lot of value in learning how to just show up and do the work, even if you're not totally feeling it. You know, I'm, I'm learning that great athletes and performers shouldn't just focus on raising their A game, they should also be focused on raising their C game or their D game, because some days that's where you are. And if you're able to take your game at a C or D level and still find some value in it, to still contribute something, that just elevates your, your range as a whole to the other level. One of my favorite examples of this, I know I just gave myself as an example, but there's a, there's a better example that's not me, and it's Seth Godin, the marketing expert who I think is actually more like an undercover philosopher. Anyway, he is a terrific writer. His books are always hot sellers. His podcast, whenever he speaks, a lot of people listen to it. But his main thing is releasing a blog, generally a pretty short essay-style blog, every single day. And I don't think any single one of his blogs has done massively well. I mean, relative to most people they have, but it's not like he's famous for just one piece. It's more so the fact that people consistently expect deep, meaningful insight from him. I also need to note that a lot of folks who sometimes do make that big splash and then get all this attention suddenly are the most subject to scrutiny that can be really unhelpful and potentially detrimental to creative development. 
So that's not always even something you want. Value those spaces where you're not getting waves of attention and you'll be better prepared for it when you do. Now I know my first bit of advice was ignore the big splash culture, just go do your own thing, develop as a creative. My other bit of advice is pay attention to big splash culture. Figure it out, learn how the game is played. You're not gonna play this game every single time, but knowing how it's played can only serve you well. So in the big picture, I try to not have my work be beholden to big splash culture uh, any more than it needs to be, but knowing a simple trick that can take something you release from total obscurity to being seen a bit more is actually worth the time getting to know. You know, if I make a painting, I might not want to jump through all the hoops to get it to go on tour with a traveling exhibit, but at least I can hang it in the, the main area of a cafe instead of in the bathroom, knowing more people are going to see it there. As much as I think this big splash culture has been a net negative for creativity as a whole, there are helpful things we can get out of it. For example, learning how to write for short form social media platforms like Twitter back in the day uh, really helped me be better at choosing efficient, high impact words instead of droning on and on. Learning the art of a hook that draws in an audience and captures their attention right away is helpful whether you want to make two hour long cinema verite pieces or TikTok videos. If you understand this reality, understand the game, and understand how it's played, you'll have more control when you're making the decision to disengage or to play a little. There is value in the slow, steady, creative process, despite the fact that we live in a big splash culture as far as our media environment goes. At the same time, don't be afraid to learn the game, to know how it's played, and then to make your own choice. Is this a time I play along? Or is this the time I do my own thing? There's value to both. Alright, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.